Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to May's uh, public uh, evening lecture. Um, before I say anything else, the next uh, June's will be held on June 27th, and there is no title yet for the talk, but it will be on USGS Wildland Fire S Science Research, so something that's very appropriate at the moment. <coughs> My name is David Schwartz. Over the years, you may have seen me up here uh, giving a public lecture. Um, in October of, uh, of 2018, well, actually 2017, after 33 years here at the USGS, I decided commuting from Danville to Menlo Park was no longer viable, and uh, I retired. And I'll put that in quotations. I'm an emeritus scientist. Uh, I'm involved with ongoing projects, uh, and working at the USGS, it's sort of like the Eagles Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Um, well, tonight I'm very uh, pleased to be able to uh, introduce Suzanne Hecker. Suzanne is an earthquake geologist, a paleoseismologist, a tectonic geomorphologist, and she loves studying active faults. And we're going to hear a, a lot about one of the Bay Area's major active faults tonight. Uh, Suzanne graduated from Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. She got her master's at the University of Arizona, where she studied the 1954 Dixie Valley Fairview Peak earthquake rupture in Nevada. And uh, I had the good fortune to meet Suzanne in 1988, uh, when she was working for the Utah Geological Survey. And uh, in 1992, we actually extracted her from the Utah Survey and hired, hired her here at the USGS. Uh, and tonight, uh, she'll be talking about the Rogers Creek Fault. But before I allow her to come up and start speaking, I'd like to put the uh, Rogers Creek into a little bit of historical perspective. And if you were living in the Bay Area at the time of the 1906 earthquake and you looked at a geological map, what you would see, you'd see faults on that map. The San Andreas Fault was known, and it was on the map. Part of the San Gregorio Fault was on the map. The Hayward Fault was mapped. Um, and uh, the Northern Calaveras, which at the time was called the Sinole Fault, was on the map. But the Greenville Fault, the Concord Fault, and the Rogers Creek Fault had yet to be, had yet to be identified. And um, in 1908, G.K. Gilbert, a very, very well-known uh, USGS geologist, uh, hired a Berkeley professor named, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Harry O. Wood. Uh, and asked him, he contracted with him for $1,000, which was a lot of money at the time, and asked him to develop a fault map for Northern California. So Wood went to work on that. And then in 1916, he published a paper in the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America and it was called California Earthquakes, a Synthetic Study of Recorded Shocks. And what Wood tried to do was to take what was known about historical seismicity and associate it with known or suspected active faults. And Wood was very bright, and he knew that slip-on faults produced earthquakes. Not everybody thought that at the time, even though they had had 1906. And uh, there are two little, little sections out of his paper, and I'd just like to read them to you. It's hard to see. He said, the Hayward's fault, and they called it Hayward's, not Hayward. Uh, that changed over time. Uh, the Hayward's fault stretches southeastwardly from San Pablo Bay along the western margin of the hills east of Berkeley and on for a distance of 50 miles surely, possibly for 100 miles or more. It is probable that it may extend northwestwardly beyond San Pablo Bay. 
its complete extent has not been worked out. And there's a little footnote, number 10. And the footnote says, since this study reached a very advanced stage, work in the field conducted by the RIDA in Sonoma and Mendocino counties, northwestward from the San Pablo Bay terminus of this fault, that's the Hayward Fault, has brought to light abundant evidence of youthful fault trace phenomena lying in a line along a natural extension of the Hayward's Fault in this direction. These features undoubtedly extend many miles northwest from San Pablo Bay. Their course has yet to be completely delineated. And then he had a uh, plate in the paper, and this is part of that plate. And um, on it is the San Andreas Fault, the Calaveras, the Hayward, and then you see this line going up through Santa Rosa and Ukiah. And actually what Wood said in the paper was, there is sort of a linear band of earthquakes that extends from the Eureka area down to San Pablo Bay. And uh, as he, his exact words were, along this band, there is a fault or a group of faults as yet not discovered. But he considered that there were active faults in this zone, and he drew this line. And he called it the Eureka, Ukiah, San Pablo line. It wasn't a fault, but it was a place where he suspected active faults existed. And this line, basically defines our currently known locations of the Rogers Creek and the Makama Fault. So he was very prescient, he was very intuitive. Uh, he took a small amount of information and put together a bigger picture. And uh, now, 103 years later, you'll have the opportunity from, to hear from Suzanne about what we've learned regarding the Rogers Creek Fault. So Suzanne? Thank you, David. Can everybody hear me in the back? And maybe we should turn down the house lights. Um, well, David's introduction may be a hard act to follow. but um, So what I'll do is I'll start off by introducing the Rogers Creek Fault, and then I'll give some background information and context as, as to why improved mapping of active faults is important for accurate characterization of earthquake hazards. Before I go any further, I'm going to set my pointer. OK, so this is an earthquake forecast map showing known active faults in the Bay Area. And the major branches of the plate boundary fault system are shown in the different colors. The lesser known smaller faults are in yellow. So the Rogers Creek Fault extends from San Pablo Bay through Santa Rosa to north of Healdsburg. And Healdsburg is right about here. So analyses have indicated that the combined Rogers Creek Hayward Fault Branch has the highest <coughs> likelihood, uh, about a 33% chance, of producing a large regionally damaging earthquake, about magnitude 6.7 or greater, by the year 2043. And there's a 72% chance of one or more of these size earthquakes happening anywhere in the region. So here's a simplified map of, plate boundary, um, of the plate boundary showing the direction of motion between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates. So the Pacific plate is moving northwestward uh, slowly and continually at a rate of about one and a half inches a year past the North American plate. About a quarter of this motion is being stored and occasionally released on the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults. So as a result of this motion, the dominant sense of movement across the faults um, that make up the plate boundary is right lateral strike slip. So these block diagrams illustrate this kind of movement. Uh, T1 would be the time before an earthquake. And you can think of right lateral strike slip as if you're standing on one side of the fault and looking across to the other side, when an earthquake happens, the other side will move to your right. 
So fortunately, only large earthquakes are energetic enough to rupture up to the Earth's surface. So this is illustrated by this pair of block diagrams. Uh, small earthquake ruptures remain, remain buried in the subsurface, whereas in a large earthquake, a rupture can grow to encompass pretty much the entire width of the fault plane and break up to the Earth's surface. So where the fault meets the surface of the Earth, this is called the fault trace, the trace of the fault, and this is what we map when we're mapping active faults. So how large is large? What size earthquakes can produce surface rupture? So this is a plot of historical earthquakes worldwide that have ruptured to the surface, showing the relation between the length of rupture and the magnitude of the earthquake. And the symbols represent different types of fault movement. So I already told you about strike slip, which is a kind of horizontal or lateral movement. Reverse and normal faults are different kinds of vertical slip. So you see that there's a clear trend that longer ruptures produce larger earthquakes, although there is some scatter. And the smallest earthquakes that produce surface rupture are about magnitude five and a half to six. Although earthquakes of this size and larger can happen on certain kinds of faults and not break to the surface. Um, this is true of some reverse faults in certain settings. So the longest rupture in the catalog is right here. This is the 1906 magnitude 7.9 earthquake, and it was almost 300 miles long, the rupture. So the photo in the upper, uh, the upper photo is of a fence uh, near Bolinas that was offset eight and a half feet by the earthquake. In the lower uh, right, there's this image of a woman standing next to the 1906 rupture. And I want to point out that on this hillside, the fault rupture follows a pre-existing bench or a slight reduction in the slope. And this is actually like a scar in the landscape. And it results from recurrent fault ruptures over the course of thousands of years. And this is the kind of landform feature that geologists look for to map active faults. So it was once conventional wisdom that the length of an individual fault constrains how long an earthquake rupture can grow to be. Um, we know that large earthquakes can occur on a single fault, uh, like on the San Andreas Fault, but we've come to learn that they can also occur by breaking across multiple faults. So here's an example of a complex multi-fault rupture that occurred in the Mojave Desert in 1992. And it's one of the first earthquakes that really made scientists aware that earthquakes are not always confined to a single fault. So this earthquake broke portions of five faults, and most had been mapped before the earthquake, but there was an important connecting fault right there called the Kickapoo Fault, or Lander's Fault, that was not identified before the earthquake, although later geologic studies found evidence that it, it did have a history of, of surface rupture. It just hadn't been noticed before. So the Kickapoo Fault allowed the earthquake, which started at the south end of the Johnson Valley Fault, to propagate across to the Homestead Valley Fault, and from there um, on to several other faults, allowing the rupture to grow to 50 miles in length. In comparis comparison, the Johnson Valley Fault is only 35 uh, miles. Did I say miles? So 50 miles long, and the Johnson Valley Fault is 35 miles long, including a portion of that fault that didn't rupture in this earthquake. So here's a photo of a house that's built on the Kickapoo Fault, and it was damaged by the 1992 rupture. And it really illustrates one reason why it's important to know where active faults are located uh, before an earthquake occurs. So an earlier earthquake, the 1971 magnitude 6.6 .6 San Fernando earthquake near Los Angeles, had extensive surface rupture that damaged numerous homes and commercial buildings built across the fault. And this earthquake led to passage of the Alquist Priola Earthquake Fault Zoning Act, uh, the act was named for two state senators who introduced the legislation. And the law prohibits the building of structures, most structures, for human occupancy across traces of active faults. So this led to a program of active <coughs> fault mapping by the California Geological Survey in order to establish regulatory zones. And in these zones, geologic investigations have to be done before a building is built to make sure that it won't be constructed across an active fault. 
So an active fault is defined for this purpose as having ruptured, usually repeatedly, in the last 11,000 years, which is um, the time period of the most recent geologic epoch called the Holocene. So here's another example of a complex rupture, one that occurred not long ago, the 2014 magnitude 6 South Napa earthquake. So this earthquake ruptured across a broad array of faults within the West Napa fault zone. Some of these uh, strands that ruptured had not been mapped and none had been zoned as active. So it was after the fact that, oops, it was after the fact that the state, it's going the wrong direction, Okay, so it was after the earthquake in 2018 that the state established regulatory zones along these ruptures. So a little bit late for that earthquake. But the problem is that these smaller faults produce smaller displacements at the surface. And they may move less frequently, so they are less well ex ex expressed in the landscape and therefore they're harder to map. So the largest displacement in this earthquake was 46 centimeters, I don't know if you can read that, um, and so that's 18 inches, and that's only 1 20th of the largest slip that occurred on the 1906 earthquake rupture, for example. So now we're going to take a look at how recent advances in remote sensing technology have made possible higher resolution fault mapping. Okay, so first I'm going to give you a short introduction into the type of landform features, the geomorphology, that forms along active strike slip faults. And it's illustrated here by this classic stretch of the San Andreas Fault, it's an aerial view. And this is in the Carrizo Plain in Southern California. And the fault here is defined as this sharp line and it's marked by fault scarps, which are steps in the, in the landscape, and also by offsets of drainage channels. Um, in particular, the largest channel here is Wallace Creek, and you can see where Wallace Creek takes a sharp right bend and is offset, uh, it's 430 feet along the fault. So when the channel first formed, when it first cut, it flowed straight across the fault. So it has accumulated this offset over the course of many large earthquakes that happen about once every few hundred years. And here's an older abandoned channel that's been offset more than twice as far. So other features that are common along strike slip faults uh, shown in this diagram are benches, um, which I pointed out in that photo of the 1906 earthquake, linear valleys, uh, linear ridges, um, scarps I mentioned, sag ponds, which are water-filled depressions are also common. So an aerial perspective is important for mapping active faults, and historically aerial photographs had been the basis for mapping. So overlapping photography provides a shift in perspective that enables depth perception, which is important for recognizing landforms. So this, this method does work well where the ground surface is visible from above, but less so where vegetation obscures the ground. So fortunately, in the last couple decades, there's a new surveying method that has become available that overcomes this problem. And that is LIDAR. So LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, is a three-dimensional laser scanning method that can be used to make high-resolution topographic maps. And it doesn't depend on a clear view of the ground. So this technology involves sending pulsed laser light from a source mounted on an aircraft. And then you measure the reflected, pulse, <coughs> reflected pulses with a sensor. And differences in laser return wavelengths and times give you information on distance to the objects below. So some of the laser light almost always reaches the ground, even where you have pretty thick vegetation, and it reflects back up to the sensor. So these last returns or ground returns can be isolated and then used to make digital models of the topography. So a LIDAR survey of the Bay Area's major faults was flown in 2007. Here's a footprint of the survey flown along the Rogers Creek Fault. And then a higher resolution, higher density uh, survey was flown for all of Sonoma County in 2013. And it was this data set that I principally used for the new mapping of the Rogers Creek. 
So here's an example from the northern San Andreas Fault of how LIDAR can be used to see beneath dense forest canopy. So on the left is an aerial photograph, and on the right is an image produced from the model of the full LIDAR data set. So what you're seeing are the tops of trees. But you can filter the LIDAR point cloud to remove all but the ground returns, essentially removing the trees and leaving a so-called bare earth image. So even though this is an older vintage data set, so it's not the highest of resolutions, um, you can clearly see these strong liniments that define the surface trace of the San Andreas. Okay, now so let's consider the Rogers Creek Fault in the context of rupture complexity and multi-fault ruptures. So many of the smaller faults in the region shown in yellow lie close to the major faults, but little is known about how these faults interact. In particular, fault number four, right there, which uh, is called the Bennett Valley Fault, lies less than two miles east of the Rogers Creek Fault. And it extends to the north uh, and projects toward the Mayakama or Mayakama Fault, which is another major plate boundary fault. And it lies about five miles to the east of the Rogers Creek Fault and overlaps much of it. So we're going to take a look a little bit later about um, on how these, these uh, faults may interact and their mapped relationships. So I want to point out an important example of interlinking faults, and that is between the Rogers Creek and Hayward Fault. So it had been suspected that these two faults might be connected beneath San Pablo Bay, and this possibility was accounted for in hazard models, but only recently was direct evidence found of faulting beneath the bay. So this is work that was done by USGS scientist Janet Watt and her colleagues. And Janet gave a great public lecture on this um, about a year ago. So I encourage you to look for that online if you didn't see it. So for this study, they used a seismic reflection method to image shallow sediment layers beneath the seafloor of San Pablo Bay. And the method, which is illustrated with that cartoon on the left, involves emitting high-frequency acoustic waves from a boat towed source and recording the signal that reflects off of layers of sediment that have contrasting acoustic impedance properties. So the survey track lines are shown in yellow on this map, and the data were processed to produce two-dimensional cross-sections from which the researchers could um, examine and look for evidence where the layers of sediment have been broken and offset by faulting. And three examples of this are shown on the right. So places where they identified evidence of faulting are mapped by X's on this, on this map. And if you simply connect the dots, oh, I did it again. You can map the Hayward Fault where it trends beneath the bay. So the north end of the fault bends slightly to the north and projects directly into a branch of the Rogers Creek Fault that has been mapped as active using the LIDAR. And we also found evidence of active faulting in the Sears Point area on the Sonoma Raceway. So this provides a linking structure between the Rogers Creek and the um, extension of the Hayward Fault beneath the bay. So now we know that these faults appear to be connected. And the question is, have they produced um, earthquakes together, a single earthquake, in the past? So to evaluate this possibility, we need to turn to the science of paleoseismology. And this is the geologic um, study of large prehistoric earthquakes. So geologists excavate trenches across the trace of an active fault to uncover evidence of old earthquakes. This example is shown here on the left um, on the Hayward Fault. So we tend to target sites that have active fine grain deposition because these kinds of sites have, have the best opportunity of preserving a continuous record of surface faulting. So here's an example from the south end of the Rogers Creek Fault. And so this is a trench log where we've mapped out the relationships we see on the trench wall. So what we do is we strive to identify the ground surface that was present at the time of an earthquake. An example here is this red line. This represents the ground surface that was present at the time of the most recent large earthquake on the fault. And then we collect um, material from sediment beneath that horizon and above it in order to bracket the time of that earthquake. 
So in this particular trench, we used radiocarbon dating of charcoal to date the sediment below the earthquake event horizon. And then we used the arrival of non-native pollen associated with European settlement um, in the 1800s to date the sediment above this horizon. So it turns out that the timing of the most recent earthquake on the Rogers Creek Fault is similar to the timing of earthquakes or earthquake or earthquakes on the Hayward Fault, allowing for the possibility of a combined rupture sometime between 1715 and 1776, which is the beginning of the historical period. So rupture that involves both faults could produce an earthquake as large as magnitude seven and a half. However, because of the in, uh, inherent uncertainties in the dating methods, we can't know for sure whether these faults ruptured together. But if they did occur as separate earthquakes, they probably occurred within a few decades of one another, which also has implications for earthquake hazards in the region. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the new mapping of the Rogers Creek Fault. So using the LIDAR-based imagery, we identify geomorphic landform evidence of active faulting along the entire Rogers Creek Fault, including the entire, the entire Healdsburg section of the fault north of Santa Rosa. So this increases the known length of active faulting by 10 miles for a total fault length of at least 45 miles. So this increases the length-based estimate of magnitude on the fault by about a tenth of a magnitude unit. But more importantly, especially for the residents of Healdsburg, it increases the proximity of strong shaking and brings surface faulting right through the town. So we found, um, okay, I gotta show you that. And then, so we found that the zone of faulting is also broader and more complex than previously known. Fault strands that are outside of the main zone of faulting tend to be less well expressed, and so we've categorized these as part of the distributed zone of deformation, and we show those in orange. And then fault strands whose origins are uncertain are in yellow, and some of these could be landslide related or bedrock features. So for the first time, we've been able to map the active trace of the fault through central Santa Rosa, and we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. And then as I mentioned already, um, there's evidence of active faulting that branches to the south at the south end of the Rogers Creek Fault and appears to connect with faulting at Sears Point and then with the continuation of the Hayward Fault beneath San Pablo Bay. So here's a shaded relief image showing the main trace of the fault and how it relates to topography. So most of the fault is associated with positive relief, uh, hilly and mountainous terrain. And this is evidence of compressional forces caused by a slight misalignment of the fault with respect to plate boundary motion. However, some of the relief is locally generated by bends in the fault. So notice the topographic low at Santa Rosa where the fault takes a right bend. So I'm gonna show you this diagram that um, shows you how topography is created on a right lateral strike slip at bends in a fault. So at a right bend, you get release, a releasing bend, and as a result, you get um, subsidence, uh, extension and subsidence. And then at left bends, these are um, restraining bends, and you get crowding and uplift. So an example of a left bend is at um, Sonoma Mountain. Here you can see the fault takes a broad left bend, and here you have uh, the mountain formed. Another example is toward the north end of the fault, right here at Fitch Mountain, which is not labeled, but again you have another left bend. So before I leave this slide, I just want to point out the Bennett Valley and Myakama Faults, which I mentioned earlier, uh, lie in proximity to the Rogers Creek. So next I'm going to take you on a short Google Earth aerial tour of the sub southern part of the fault. We'll start in the mud flats at the south end of the fault, and then we'll fly to the north around the left bend on the southwest flank of Sonoma Mountain. So although the fine scale features won't be visible, um, see if you can pick out where the, fall, the fault follows a broad bench and linear valley along the flank of Sonoma Mountain. So these features are larger scale and are the result of long-term uh, repeated fault movement. 
So I'm going to be showing you the main zone of faulting in yellow. Usually it's in red. Um, and I've marked locations of sag ponds, which are those water-filled depressions with these concentric circles. And there's lots of sag ponds along this part of the fault. And I'll also mention that the relief is exaggerated two times um, in this view. So here we are starting at the south end at the mud flats and flying along the fault. And you can see us uh, crossing a few sag ponds. And see as we approach Sonoma Mountain how the fault takes a left bend. And see here if you can um, see that bench I was referring to right here on the side of the mountain. And there's a slight valley formed along it. Okay, so from here, the fault continues to the northwest, and it goes along the east side of Taylor Mountain. And beyond that, you can see the topographic low where Santa Rosa is located. And there's a, I think you can see here, there's a right bend um, where the fault goes across Santa Rosa. And that's that releasing bend I talked about. Okay, so here's a static aerial image from the south end of the fault. The location is marked by the star. And this is um, a place where the fault geomorphology is particularly well developed, SP or sag ponds. So now I'll show you what it looks like on a LIDAR shaded relief image. So here artificial illumination is from the northeast. And the fault is marked by strong tonal liniments through here. So it really pops out. The other liniments you see, um, like here's a landslide for instance. Landslides are common along the fault. Oops, I don't know, I'm going to keep doing that. You can see it again, and there's the interpretation of the, the faults. Okay, so this is an example from the north end of the fault, just south of the Russian River. So here's an oblique aerial view. The push pin marks the location of this image. So here's Fitch Mountain and part of the town of Healdsburg off to the left. So this is a part of the fault that wasn't mapped as active prior to this study. But here with the LIDAR imagery, you might be able to pick out there's a sharp tonal liniment. This is the fault. And as it continues here, it actually forms an uphill facing scarp or a step so that stream alluvium has ponded against the scarp here. This would actually make a good trench site um, and we're looking to get access. This is on private ranch land. And in the upper right is the interpretation of the faulting. And here's that oblique image um, showing the main trace of the fault in red. And you can see where it's, it's wrapping around the southwest flank of Fitch Mountain, this left bend, the restraining bend. And so you have considerable local uplift and relief that has developed over a long period of time. So next I'm going to be talking about um, another line of evidence that the Rogers Creek Fault between Santa Rosa and Healdsburg is currently active, and that is fault creep. So creep is slow slipping at and near the surface of a fault. And um, this corroborates the conclusion that this part of the fault is active. So first I'll show you some examples of creep from the Hayward Fault, um, which is it's a famous fault that creeps famously. And there's lots built across it, lots of roads um, and buildings that have been damaged by continual creep. So you can see those <coughs> offsets. So only recently has creep been recognized along the Rogers Creek Fault, um, probably because rates are slower and also the fault is less urbanized. Okay, so this is a study done by researchers from UC Riverside, and they documented creep on the northern Rogers Creek Fault using a method called INSAR. So INSAR is a satellite-based geodetic method that uses repeat radar images to generate um, maps of surface deformation over time. So this map is a, shows the pattern of fault parallel surface motion, where the velocities are positive, the blues and the purples, that means movement of the ground is toward the southeast. And where there's an abrupt step in velocities from west to east, that's consistent with right lateral creep. 
So the fault appears to be creeping to the north of Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is SR here. But it's absent uh, to the south of the city. And here's a graph showing how measured creep rate varies along the fault. The vertical bars are 95% confidence intervals, and these triangles are creep measured using alignment arrays closer into the fault. So creep, um, so the average creep rate along this portion of the fault is about two millimeters a year, which is less than a tenth of an inch a year. So not very, not very fast but it appears to increase quite a bit at Santa Rosa. It may be as high as six to eight millimeters a year at Santa Rosa. But to the south of Santa Rosa, there seems to be no creep. So the interpretation is that um, the area to the south may be fully locked and storing all of the strain energy. So we'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes. So we've seen ground evidence of surface creep at a couple of locations, one in North Santa Rosa and the other in Healdsburg. So where a strand of the fault crosses Santa Rosa Memorial Park, curbs and sidewalks are deflected, about two inches or five centimeters. And this cemetery is 50 years old, so that indicates a creep rate here of about one millimeter a year. And to the north, where the fault crosses an old road in the Healdsburg Ridge Open Space Preserve, creep is expressed as these fractures in pavement. And the pattern of left-stepping fractures is consistent with right lateral slip. OK, so now we're going to take a look at where the fault passes through the topographic low at Santa Rosa. So you'll recall that Santa Rosa lies within a right releasing bend in the fault, and it's a geometry that results in a component of extension and land subsidence. So prior to the LIDAR mapping, the fault was believed to be buried by young alluvium stream deposits where it crosses the floodplain of Santa Rosa Creek. So its location was inferred by projecting the location of mapped strands to the south and north of the floodplain. So here is an elevation map created from the LIDAR data. Red to green is going from lower to higher elevations. And there's about a 30-foot change in relief across the width of this survey, um, which is about 3 quarters of a mile wide. So this indicates that the average slope of the floodplain is only about a half of percent. So it's pretty low uh, gradient. So if you look closely, you might be able to see that the LIDAR shows that there are these faint uh, fault liniments that trend northwest, southwest, north e northwest, southeast across the floodplain. And the grid pattern you can see are city streets. So the interpretation is on the right. Um, and these fault strands define the outline of what is known as a pull-apart basin. Now, pull-apart basins commonly develop to accommodate the extension that occurs at releasing bends. So here's our little cartoon of restraining and releasing bends showing where a pull-apart basin might develop. So the basin beneath Santa Rosa has a rather complex configuration. The main basin here is about uh, three-quarters of a mile long and, and two-tenths of a mile wide. But it bifurcates at the south end, and there's a separate smaller basin to the southeast. OK, so now I'm showing the LIDAR-based mapping on the Google Earth base. And the inferred trace is dotted in yellow. And I've also plotted the locations of schools and a hospital. And uh, it seems like all too often um, we find these kind of critical facilities near active faults. So this is a topographic profile uh, created from the LIDAR elevation data across the most prominent fault scarp on the east side of the pull-apart basin. This white line shows the location. So I've plotted this at 25 times vertical exaggeration, just so you can clearly see the scarp. And you'll notice that the slope below the scarp is, is more gentle than above. And this is likely due to ponding and deposition of sediment within that pull-apart basin. So here's a ground view looking at the scarp. And so it's expressed just as a subtle rise in the street in what otherwise is pretty flat floodplain topography. So an important question is how the expression of faulting at the surface may relate to the underlying geology. 
So geophysical measurements of fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic and gravitational fields can be used to draw conclusions about the rock properties at depth. So these are geophysical maps, and they reveal that beneath central Santa Rosa lies a small but prominent body of rock that's defined by uh, high gravity and strong magnetic susceptibility. So in detail, the western margin of the rock body, um, as defined by these geophysical edges or boundaries, coincide in map view with the eastern side of the pull-apart basin, shown right here. So this suggests to us that this complex geometry of the pull-apart basin may be related to properties of the faulted rock at depth. And so we suspect that there may be an increase in frictional resistance along this part of the fault that has led to this geometry. And that this rock body, in combination with the larger Bennett Valley um, high, gravity high to the south, may be a stuck patch on the fault uh, that has remained locked and is accumulating stress. And so if this is the case, and if this part of the fault were to break in a large earthquake, this could release a large amount of seismic energy beneath Santa Rosa. So you may recall that this is also the south end of where creep has been identified. So the, this indicates that there's a change in slip behavior here from partially creeping to the north to fully locked to the south. So this is consistent with the idea that this is a stuck patch on the fault. So it also could be that this difference in slip behavior could have led over time to bending of the fault and creation of this right releasing geometry. So this um, is a topic of, that needs really further investigation because it does have implications for shaking hazard in Santa Rosa. So this October is the 50th anniversary of a pair of moderate size but damaging earthquakes that occurred on the north side of Santa Rosa um, and on the north side of this dense magnetic rock body here. So this is consistent with the idea that stress may be concentrated in this area. So the, uh, the earthquakes were highly damaging even though they were moderate in size and ground shaking was strong in the downtown area and there was quite a bit of damage. In the next slide we'll take a look at the results of the study that examined why this might have happened. And I'll be showing you a map of sedimentary basin thickness that's derived from this gravity map. And in particular, I'll be talking about the Katadi Basin. So the Katadi Basin is right here. And it's filled with low density sediment that thickens uh, and deepens to more than a mile beneath the surface southwest of Santa Rosa. So also I'm showing you on this map um, areas of concentrated earthquake damage in Santa Rosa that occurred in the 1969 earthquakes, this dark uh, black circle, and also in the 1906 earthquake shown by the pink oval. So the damage from these earthquakes was in the same area. And even though the 1906 earthquake occurred on the San Andreas Fault more than 20 miles away, it pretty much destroyed downtown Santa Rosa. So when seismic waves enter deep sedimentary basins, they slow down and increase in amplitude, and thereby they increase the shaking at the surface. So downtown Santa Rosa lies at the northeast protruding edge of the Katadi Basin. So the thinking is that um, energy from both the 1906 and 1969 earthquakes were, was focused um, into this area, causing um, the strong shaking that was experienced. So the lower pair of maps uh, show the results of ground motion simulations that tested the effect of the Katadi Basin on shaking. So the strongest shaking is in red, and on the left is the model run with the basin structure, and on the right uh, is without the basin structure. So you can see how strong the shaking is if you consider the Katadi Basin. So these results support the inference that the Katadi Basin does play a significant role in the strength of shaking in and around Santa Rosa. So lastly, we're going to take a look at preliminary mapping of a zone of active traces along the Bennett Valley Fault. So the Bennett Valley Fault crosses the forested flanks of Sonoma Mountain, and until the LIDAR data became available, the forest canopy pretty much hid evidence that the Bennett Valley Fault is active. 
except for at the very uh, north end, this north trending strand here, the Spring Valley strand, has really well, ge well expressed geomorphology and it has been trenched and shown to be active. So the LIDAR uh, data for Sonoma County reveals clear evidence of recent faulting all along the Bennett Valley Fault and along faults in the area between the Bennett Valley Fault and the Rogers Creek. So in these shaded relief images, the arrows point to alignments of fault features. There's sharp tonal liniments, uh, scarps that face both east and west, um, offset landforms. Here's a drainage that's right laterally offset. So these are all classic expressions of active faulting. So this youthful geomorphology isn't apparent um, on the LIDAR where the fault crosses the urbanized um, floodplain of Santa Rosa Creek. There are some uplifted landforms that mark the location of the fault. But I've inspected the LIDAR to the north of the floodplain and found a few discontinuous fault liniments here that project northward toward the Mayakama Fault, which is the next major plate boundary to the east and north of the Rogers Creek. So here we've zoomed out uh, to show the Mayakama Fault. And here the mapping for that fault comes from the USGS online fault database where color indicates age of recency of rupture. So orange strands, which there's some orange strands at the north end here, um, are active. Yellow strands uh, have less age certainty, um, so they can be regarded as potentially active. But if these faults um, are all active and they're connected, then earthquake cascades or multi-fault multi ruptures are possible, where rupture could begin on one fault and propagate onto another. And I'll show you an example of how this could happen, where rupture starts on the Mayakama Fault, continues on to the Bennett Valley Fault, then on to the Rogers Creek, and from there possibly on to the Hayward Fault. So this connectivity opens the possibility of larger than anticipated earthquakes and would expose eastern Santa Rosa to greater hazard from shaking and from surface rupture. So in summary, um, new mapping of the Rogers Creek Fault reveals that it is longer, broader, and more connected to its neighbors than previously known, implying that multi-fault ruptures and larger earthquakes are possible. Greater rupture complexity um, which in some locations, such as Santa Rosa, may have implications for patterns of energy release and ground shaking hazard. And a longer, wider zone of faulting means more areas are exposed to surface rupture. Thank you, and I'll leave you with some resources to help you prepare for the next earthquake. <laughs> They're recording it, they need it. <laughs> there is hydrothermal activity north of Santa Rosa along Highway 101. That's most associated with some sort of a uh, drifting type of uh, fault. Is there any relationship to the Rogers Creek extension north with that? I'm not familiar with exactly where you're talking about. Are you talking about the geysers area? North of Calistoga. Yeah. Um, so if it's the geysers, it's not on the Rogers Creek. It's a separate um, area that is probably related to general fault activity, but is not specifically related to a, you know, a major fault. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but I'm not completely familiar with where you're referring to. It's not uncommon, though, to have um, hydrothermal activity related to faulting. Lots of springs are along faults, and you know, a lot of heat is generated at depth, so. I, I can't identify its relationship to the faults you're describing, but I, do just, I can just tell you it's to the, uh, just to the east of Highway 101. Okay, thank you. Anybody else?
Okay. Um, if that's oh. Um, can you say, in, in for in, in layman's terms, a little bit about how you model the behavior of these plates? I'm sorry, model the behavior of the of the plates, or um, of the in, in specifically in terms of of what um, in terms of uh, earthquake forecasts or no? What um, uh, how do you approximate the the behavior of that material? Is that is that a solid or is that a goo or? Um, so there's there's a lot of data sets that go into knowing about uh, sort of the structure of the Earth um, and uh, you know in terms of the plate motion we have geodetic um, information that tells us that about the motions sort of the broad regional motions and so that factors into knowing about the plates and how they're moving. Um, there's lots of different data sets that kind of go into to looking at the structure um, of the Earth. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. I'm, you know, I, my, my expertise is in one particular area, but there's certainly lots of different geophysical and um, various kinds of data sets that go into sort of knowing the broad picture of how the plate boundary works. Uh, you, you showed some intuitive features, no? this, as plates uh, move past each other, mm -hmm. uh, and that in one case I get a mountain, in the other case I get uh, a lower a point. Right. Um, but it's not, but it's not a hole. No? Right. So. Okay. So for that, that has to do with just the relative motion of two sides of the fault, mm -hmm. um, and. So when you have a right lateral strike slip fault and you have a bend that goes to the right, you end up creating just a small amount, relatively a small amount of extension. So it doesn't create a large hole. And most mm -hmm. of the motion is still strike slip. It's horizontal motion. Okay. It's just that because of the bend, there's a slight amount of extension. So over time, that can lead to a valley but at the same time, you get material sediment sort of deposited, mm -hmm. so it kind of keeps up with it. Um, so it's just a gradual process. But yeah, the amount of extension is relatively small compared to the fault movement, which is mostly lateral strike slip. Okay. So it's a local phenomena um, okay. along the fault, but mm -hmm. over time you get landforms developed you know, over the course of many like hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Thank you. Just, just to kind of uh, add to, to that, um, when you have a single fault and it has a large earthquake rupture, and you go out and you measure it, there is a variability that you met, mentioned. And in some places the slip is low, and in other places it's higher. What happens over time? Well, that's one of the things that we try and study. It could be that during the next earthquake, the area of low slip has higher, and the area of high slip has lower, so that over time, things sort of balance out. Or if you have a system of faults, you can have low slip, and an adjacent fault picks up the additional slip. So there's a balance across the plate boundary. You know, this is, the Bay Area has the highest density of active faults per square mile of any urban center of, in the country. And the earth itself is extremely complex. Uh, there's a huge variability in physical process, properties as you go uh, down deeper, as you go along the length of these faults. So it's, as Suzanne said, it's a very, very complex interaction. But from geodesy, from geology, we can actually measure the amount of slip in an individual earthquake or over time to build up a rate of movement on all of these different faults. And, uh, you know, that's a primary focus of our research is to understand how these complex boundary zones work. And the better we understand the physics of that, the better estimates we can make of what's going to happen in the future, uh, how large the earthquakes are going to be, and where they're going to occur. If that you know. 
Hi, so first, thank you for your talk. I thought it was well presented. Okay, thank you. Um, you showed a couple examples of uh, fault surface ruptures, you know, and are those selected just to be like the most dramatic, clean uh, structure uh, ruptures, or does as the rupture moves down the fault, does it change from very, you know, well contained to sort of more vague, uh, occurring over a, a, a larger area, sort of across the fault? Because I would think there'd be a lot of uh, inhomogeneity in the rock mm -hmm. uh, as you move along the fault, and sometimes it'd be breaking very closely and sometimes kind of more squishily, and that's a scientific term, of course. <laughs> and um, so I'm just wondering, uh, is, uh, is, that, is, that, is that true, that it varies, or is it always quite sharp along the whole fault? Um, it can vary, and I showed the one example or a couple examples of complex ruptures. Um, the Landers earthquake rupture is quite complex. Um, so, you know, it depends what scale you're looking at, too. So, you know, sometimes um, you, you can get a very sharp single strand of the fault. Um, in other places, there's quite a bit of complexity. Um, if I can find Landers' example. Um, here we go. So it's hard to see in detail, but um, as the rupture goes to the north, you can see how it's stepping from one fault to another. And in between those individual strands, you get kind of a network. Um, so that's at like a map scale, standing back. Um, but when mapping the Rogers Creek Fault, we found zones of faults that were, um, you know, uh, hundreds of meters wide, like half a mile. Um, and some of that complexity could be the result of multiple earthquakes over time, you know, rupturing over a broad zone. Um, but certainly that kind of complexity where you can get a wide zone in a single earthquake is something we see. Um, but typically the main zone of slip is pretty, pretty narrow in terms of where most of the motion is. Um, you kind of get a broader zone of deformation in places. Um, so it varies. It just kind of depends where you are on the fault. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're showing the, um, the topographic or the, mag uh, the gravity highs and lows in those different basins and, and the, and the um, <coughs> and the particular one that was near Santa Rosa. Should we think of those as a uh, uh, rock that's, that's more solid, uh, denser, or uh, not so much sediment, but more bedrock uh, it, that forms those, those chunks that are, that are more gravity high? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the ones that are low gravity are, are, just, are fill and sediment? Is exactly, that, is, yeah, is, for, the, for the density, um, it's exactly that. So the low density, which would be like the basin, is um, they're, they're fairly unconsolidated. I mean, they're still somewhat consolidated, but mm -hmm. they're not as, um, as dense or heavy, I guess, mm -hmm. as the rock that has the high gravity signal. Um, so that, that rock body beneath Santa Rosa, although we don't see it at the surface, it's down at least a half a mile, I believe. Um, there's some thinking that it might be gabbro, because gabbro has high density and high magnetic properties. Um, and that has been seen on other faults um, associated with um, uh, high frictional properties. So that might be a gabbro. But yeah, so the density um, properties, you know, there's various rock types that could be, but we have that, that to go on, I guess, in terms of knowing what it might be. Um, but it's consistent with the uh, idea that this could be an area where uh, frictional resistance is higher. Um, so this, this is work done by a colleague of mine and part of a paper that I put together. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but that's my understanding of how that works. Um, I'm intrigued by the thing that you mentioned a moment ago about um, as the fault curves, there are areas of subsidence caused by the stretching. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, at a higher scale if that um, phenomenon might be related to the fact that there's a break in the uh, Diablos and that's where the Sacramento River comes through. Is there any correlation in there or could you talk a little bit about that a little more? Um, David, do you want to talk so about, talking about the Dia Diablo? He, David's from Danville, he kind of knows that area, but is that where you mean by? 
um, there are um, there's a phenomenon of uh, the Earth stretching due to curves in the fault. And I'm curious about that on a slightly broader scale, if that might be might explain to some degree why the Sacramento River exits the Central Valley at that particular point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know what controls the uh, the Sacramento River, um, but uh, the west side of the Central Valley is um, really characterized by folding, by compression, by broad warping like this, and it's a very different style of deformation than what Suzanne's been talking about uh, on the strike slip faults. Uh, how that has affected river flow over time um, is a really good question, and um, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Hi again. Not directly related to the, um, your research or your presentation here, but it seems to me that uh, faulting is a very three-dimensional um, situation and you're studying the fault trace and things which I believe are, are basically surface mm -hmm. traces but obviously there's you know talk about fault planes and all these other things and I'm sure as it goes down to depth it's not a simple plane at least that, that'd be my guess so what is the state of the art in terms of mapping the three-dimensional nature and you know, how much understanding do we have of that uh, how much is speculation and how much we actually measure like ground penetrating radar or any other technologies that you know we have for that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So the geometry of faulting at depth, it's something that I don't work on directly, but, um, but scientists use um, seismicity for, for one thing. If you have well uh, located earthquakes, um, that can actually delineate uh, fault planes. And so a lot of the Bay Area faults are pretty much lit up by by seismicity. Um, the northern part of the Rogers Creek has a lot of small earthquakes and it shows that it's steeply dipping toward the east. Um, so that's one way to get a handle on the geometry. Um, you know, I showed you the geophysical maps um, and that helps to constrain it in a general way. The long-term geometry of the fault can be shown by these kinds of data. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to get a handle on the complexity until there's an earthquake, and then we have a lot more information. But, um, but there is often, you know, as faults come up from depth, at depth they're probably pretty much constrained to, a, to more or less a single plane. But as you get close to the Earth's surface, they tend to branch out on different scales. I mean, the, the, um, the South Napa earthquake, I showed you that array of faults um, over quite a broad area. And so that's an example. And, and people have modeled that geometry in different ways, but it really looks like the, the faults coming up and branching. Um, so there's quite a bit of complexity. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not easy to get a handle on all of that complexity before an earthquake happens. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Suzanne again.